Stephen, the, I'd like to begin with a historical question, since you worked so much also on the history of um, liberal thought. Um, where do you see the relation between the really audacious frontal assault on um, liberal values, institutions today, and the anti-liberalism of the 1930s? Ah. Um, well, it's this is... A, a a big question. We, we are repeating many of the slogans of the 1930s, such as America First, uh, Rootless Cosmopolitan, uh, National Greatness, uh, and so forth. I mean, one interesting uh, aspect of this, um, and it relates to our friend and um, hero Albert Hirschman, his first book was about the way in which a unregulated international trading system, uh, which was based on bilateral bullying and a desire for domination, created pressures within states uh, that uh, fomented anti-liberal, illiberal domestic politics. So it's a kind of a very interesting uh, uh, connection that we're drifting toward uh, a new, or I'd say a dismantling of the liberal international system which Albert was one of the participants in creating and was created in a way in order to overcome uh, that last bout of extreme anti-liberal politics. So now what's the source? Um, I think it's a different situation as in the 30s because of, there's so much more economic prosperity today than there was in Germany and France in the 30s, in France too, or anywhere. We're just much richer. Uh, Nonetheless, the, the kind of insecurity, uh, the sense of uh, uh, not, not understanding where we're headed, uh, and of course the, the, uh, the f um, real or imagined threat of having our cultures overrun by immigrants is a, uh, producing some of the same pressures. The last time we had a kind of a, a big opening to the world uh, before World War I, it created war. So these are, this is a big shock that's happening to the system. So it doesn't exactly answer your question, but I think you're right to point out that this is something that isn't the first time we've experienced it. Anti-liberalism has been with us since the advent of liberalism, practically, since the early 19th century at least. So there is a, um, uh, there's a cultural tendency f uh, and Albert Hirschman would have understood this exactly uh, very well to react to the dominant ideology with the counter ideology. And there are moments when that counter ideology, in this case anti liberalism, uh, threatens to become dominant itself. Um, does liberalism really ignore the need for um, national identities, for political leadership, um, all the kinds of vices which are being laid at its door? at the moment? Well, I mean, we have had great leaders. Uh, I mean, I do think that another word that uh, uh, younger people don't feel as, uh, to be as uh, toxic or uh, radioactive as we might is the word leader translated into German. Um, but um, uh, of course, Churchill was a liberal leader. Roosevelt was a liberal leader. We have leadership is not absent. There is a cliche that liberalism is a society. Liberalism promotes a society based on a network of consumers and producers. Uh, there's the market. There's the rule of law. But there's no leadership. I would say that if you think about the European Union, the criticism has a certain relevance. That is, where is the leadership? Where is the decision making? Who can make a strong decision? Who can respond to a crisis? I think there, the sense that the European Union has, um, has trapped the European states in a situation where leadership is a scarce resource, fairly uh, plausible uh, charge. But m m many of the uh, uh, accusations against liberalism are not true. Uh, on the other hand, uh, and liberal societies are nationalistic, uh, are bounded, have uh, laws against open immigration. These are all compatible. However, liberalism has a hard time justifying either borders or membership rules. And I think this is its one of its weaknesses, that the, the, the um, uh, arguments that liberals can give against the free movement of capital are very plausible, but 
the argument against the free movement of peoples is not that obvious. And I think the reason right-wing parties are doing so well, and uh, react, whatever you can call them, these uh, populist parties, is that they have a much clearer argument uh, than the liberals do about borders, boundaries, uh, Identity. identities. They have a stronger argument because uh, uh, if you are a cosmopolitan and a multiculturalist and a universalist, you basically uh, have a very practical argument for boundaries. It's the only way you can organize things that make sense. But you don't say that there's a, a moral difference between, let's say, as a, uh, if you ask this to a, 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 a kind of a ethnic ethno-nationalist, he would say that uh, American ethno-nationalist that a, a, a tragedy where you know, 100 American children die in a bus accident, that's morally worse than if it's 100 Indian children. That's absurd from a liberal point of view. But, uh, and all we have to say is it's the only, we, we have a more practical responsibility. That's a weaker, it's a weaker connection. So I think they, they, have, a, a, they have a capacity to, uh, the, that is the, the nationalist, the ethno-nationalist, nativist, of forces, uh, when you when they ask, do you want to invite all of Africa into Europe? Uh, you do say no, <laughs> but uh, you don't have such a good reason as they do. They have we're protecting our culture, and uh, we're saying we have to protect our liberal values. But still, it's a weaker argument. Where do you think the growing disenchantment with democracies worldwide is coming from? The data is showing a growing acceptance of authoritarian leaders, strongmen regimes, and especially under 35-year-olds have shown a strong preference for leaning in a direction which uh, comes as a surprise. Well, the generation gap is important. Partly it's memory. Uh, I think that the younger people don't remember how bad it was under illiberal authoritarian regimes. But um, no, the basic uh, change has been, I, I do think it's related to the enormous growth, of, not of inequality so much, but of the ability of national elites to live unconnected from the ordinary citizens. You saw that in the inability to predict the Brexit vote the, uh, the inability to predict Trump's uh, election, a sense of not listening. Uh, we, funny w way to think about it is that they're saying, you never listen to us, and we say, what are you talking about? Basically, there's a kind of uh, disconnect. Uh, and a, 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 um, the, in, in uh, post-World War II America and Europe, elites depended much more on ordinary citizens for to be soldiers, to be workers, uh, so basically, there's a, a shredding of the connective tissue between elites and ordinary citizens, which to me is the main uh, cause of the perception that the citizen voter, it has no uh, leverage over the political elites. Because to be, to have leverage, you need to be a citizen soldier, a citizen worker, a citizen, you know, the most extreme case is Russia, where even citizen consumers don't matter because they sell to foreigners and they don't care if the people in their own country have money in their pockets. So this is the, I think, the basic uh, dynamic of how um, a hovercraft elite that seems to live near airports, not be locally uh, rooted to speak um, English. There's an Anglophone elite around the world that is devernacularized. I think we may have had this discussion once. The, the great pre-democratic advance, both in India and in Italy, was that elites started writing in the language of ordinary, uh, ordinary people. And now we have the opposite. That is, it's people, uh, uh, elites around the world are speaking in a language in much of the world where ordinary citizens in their country don't speak it. So you're getting a, a separation of elites. And this is a wider dynamic that makes the vote uh, feeble. Because it and and at the outcome is when you vote, it doesn't matter, and you and people are aware that it doesn't matter. This produces a desire to blow up the system, it produces anti-system parties, anti-system movements, and and I think that's uh, the reason parties. Everybody in France now is running against the system, you know, because this, the the 
the party is supposed to be a belt connecting the elite to ordinary citizens, and it's not working. 